Welcome to Module 2 of Radiation Safety in Medical Imaging. Today's presentation is on dose and radiobiology. Here we review the facts about radiation and radiation protection that can help technologists effectively protect themselves and others. Gray is the measurement for the exposure absorbed dose by the patient. Sievert is the biological effect or the effect upon tissue. When we use low dose ionizing radiation for medical imaging, the potential consequences of such exposures to actually harm the patient are very, very low. But we need to know how to translate the data to evaluate the radiation risk. So let's take a look at the biological risk to humans from exposure to ionizing radiation. Let's take a look at cancer risks from low dose radiation. This presentation gives us a comprehensive review of the latest human data on the most critical question for radiation protection when we do medical imaging. First, we'll review the risks for patients. An adult exposure of one millisievert would cause a fatal cancer in one in 20,000 patients. It would cause a fatal leukemia in one in 200,000, a non-fatal cancer in one in 100,000, and a heritable risk of cancer one in 80,000. Childhood exposure, fatal cancers, one in 10,000. Fetal exposure, fatal cancer up to 15 years, one in 33,000. All cancers up to 15 years, one in 17,000. And a heritable risk of uh, passing the genes on, 1 in 42,000. Under some rare circumstances of prolonged high-dose exposure, x-rays can cause adverse health effects, such as skin reddening or erythema, tissue damage to the skin, and birth defects in utero for pregnant women that are exposed. We use high-dose radiation for treatment purposes such as radiation therapy and low-dose ionizing radiation for medical imaging. The magnitude of the dose of ionizing radiation used for treatment is significantly greater than the dose of radiation of low-dose radiation used in medical imaging. At the exposure levels associated with most medical imaging procedures, including most CT procedures, these other effects do not occur. Ionizing radiation is a form of radiation that is used in medical imaging. Ionizing radiation has enough energy to potentially cause damage to the DNA of the cell. A damaged cell repairs itself, dies, or mutates. What we worry about is the stochastic effect of cancer, which would be a mutation of the cell, and that is extremely rare, if non-existent in some exposures. For cancer to occur, something must damage the nucleus of the cell. And what is the probability of damaging the nucleus of a cell with ionizing radiation? All exams using ionizing radiation should be performed only when necessary to answer a medical question, treat a disease, or guide a surgical or other procedure. There are two methods for the energy from the ionizing radiation to damage the DNA in the nucleus of a cell. The first is an indirect action, wherein the energy causes a chemical reaction damaging damaging the nucleus. The second is the photon has a direct hit on the DNA strands, either breaking one or two strands of DNA.
In general, it is the radiographer's role to be familiar with the different types of radiation to which patients may be exposed and the effects of exposure. Ionizing radiation beams that are used for medical imaging are polyenergetic, meaning they have many energies. KEV is the term used for the average energy of the beam. KVP is the energy of the most penetrating photon or photons in the beam. They cannot go any higher than the KVP, kilovolt peak. We also use MA, milliampage, in creating our exposure to give us the radiation that we need. And we also use time. So we have radiation, which has a penetration for a specific time. The interaction of the radiation used for the patient has three different modes. One, the radiation can pass completely through without having any interaction. Two, it can be totally or partially absorbed. And three, the radiation can be scattered. Only the radiation that penetrates the patient can be received by the image receptor. And this is the only amount of radiation that can cause us an image or create an image. As the radiation enters the patient, it becomes absorbed by the tissues that it is going through. In fact, we have what's called a half value layer of tissue, which averages three to four centimeters, meaning that every three to four centimeters the radiation travels through the patient, its energy is cut in half till it finally emits from the patient as remnant radiation. Well, we've talked about radiation directly absorbed by the patient, but let's talk about the radiation source that actually gives occupational dose to the radiographer. And this source would be Compton scatter radiation that occurs in the patient. The greatest exposure to technologists during fluoroscopy, portables, and surgery is from Compton scatter radiation. Compton scatter can come from a leakage in the x-ray tube itself or be emitted from the patient. The most common type of exposure the radiographer will receive is emitted from the patient. And we can reduce the amount of that exposure to one one thousandth the original primary beam strength simply by using the inverse square law. The farther we stand away from the patient, the more the radiation disperses. When formulating the radiation exposure, we need to balance the benefits and the risks. While a benefit of a clinically appropriate x-ray imaging exam generally far outweighs the risk, efforts should be made to minimize the risk by reducing unnecessary exposure to ionizing radiation. We'll discuss in more detail the dilemma for radiation protection, and that is, what is the scientific basis for standards to protect the public from exposure to low ionizing levels of radiation? Large doses of ionizing radiation can cause extensive cellular damage and even result in death. With smaller doses, the person or irradiated organs may survive, but the cells are damaged, increasing the chance of cancer. The extent of the damage depends upon the total amount of energy absorbed, the time period and dose rate of exposure and the sensitivity of the organs exposed. Ionizing radiation affects people by depositing energy in body tissue, which can cause cell damage or cell death. In some cases, there may be no effect whatsoever. In other cases, the cell may survive but become abnormal 
either temporarily or permanently. An abnormal cell may become malignant, but if it does not become malignant, it is benign. A malignant abnormal cell is cancer. When a person is over-irradiated, there is a probability for them to receive biological damage. In addition, when cells are damaged, it increases the chance of cancer. The extent of the damage depends upon the total amount of energy absorbed, the time period and the dose rate, and the organ's sensitivity to exposure. The severity of the injury depends on the type of radiation, the absorbed dose, and the rate at which the dose was absorbed. If we have an acute absorption, meaning all at once, it is much more harmful than a large absorbed dose over several fragments of time. Radiosensitivity of the tissue is also involved. The effects are the same whether from a radiation source outside the body or from ionizing radiation material that was ingested in the body. What is a radiation dose? A radiation dose is the amount of energy deposited per kilogram of tissue or organ. Dose to a certain place in the body is known as effective dose. This is the average dose to the whole body that gives us the risk of contracting cancer due to the x-ray exposure. Overall dose is a whole body exposure. When we discuss low doses of ionizing radiation used in medical imaging, we find that it is a poor mutagen. In other words, it doesn't damage cells and have them mutate very often. But it is a very good cell killer. Damaged cells usually die and do not replicate. The primary radiation that is applied to the patient is selected by the radiographer. The radiographer creates the dose and exposure type and also the region of interest in which the interaction occurs. Using collimation keeps the radiation focused on the area of interest. The majority of the scatter radiation that is emitted from the patient is of no use in creating medical images. The medical image is created by the absorption of the radiation as it goes through different tissue types. The absorption reflects the tissue's position and density. At the low doses of ionizing radiation used in medical imaging, we are simply looking at the probability of a somatic effect, cancer. There is no other damage to the cell. There is conclusive evidence of radiation effects lacking below a total of 5,000 to 10,000 millirem exposure dose. In other words, we have no evidence that there is any damage below this level. Most population-based cancer risk estimates are based primarily on the Japanese atomic bomb survivor lifespan study. Our own bodies counter the damage by ionizing radiation at the cellular level. To counter cellular mutations, the body has an active repair process. Most of the cells that have interacted will be repaired. A few may die, and a rare few may mutate. We will discuss the linear no threshold dose theory and its validity later in this discussion. According to the International Council on Radiation Protection,
if we had a one sievert dose, the large dose of one sievert, and using this theory that all radiation is harmful no matter what, we could equate the exposure that we get from medical imaging to approximately a 5.5% chance of getting cancer from that exposure which means you have a minimum of a 94.5% of not getting cancer from this exposure. Remember, the exposure we're talking about is one sievert, which is 20 times the yearly occupational dose that you are allowed to receive. A great deal of the studies we have on the impact of ionizing radiation are based upon the lifetime studies of the survivors of the atomic bomb tests in Japan in World War II. Most, if not all, of the survivors of the atomic bomb in Japan in World War II are now deceased. But let's take a look at this population. Actually, 86,572 people survive the atomic bomb. The total cancers observed after the bomb was 8,180. And the total cancers you'd expect without the ionizing radiation from the bond or bomb would be 7,743. So there actually was an increase in this total population of 86,572 people from exposure to ionizing radiation of only 437 persons or 0.05 percent. Studies of the atomic bomb survivors do not demonstrate conclusively that low-dose radiation causes cancer. The linear no threshold model estimates only a theory that exposure to radiation can cause cancer and that all exposures are dangerous. The original research that came up with the linear no threshold dose model was done between 1927 and 1949 and had been done using fruit flies, which were irradiated at doses far beyond what humans could tolerate. Yet, this was still used as a basis for the linear no threshold theory, making its validity very suspect. A linear no threshold model has been applied to the assessment of the results or risk from exposure to moderate and high dose radiation. However, a statistically significant increase has hardly been described for radiation doses below 100 millisieverts. So low dose radiation, we have no evidence of any type of damage. Here we can take a look at the three models that can be used for assessing the ionizing radiation interaction with tissue. The first we discuss, which is the linear no threshold model. The next is a threshold model. The threshold model says as dose increases, we actually create a threshold dose that has a certain effect on biological tissue. Not that it will affect the biological tissue there, but it has the probability at that point. And the third model is the hormetic model. The hormetic model is the same as the threshold model, but it differs in this way. It actually shows that radiation is beneficial to the body in helping to fight cancer. The linear no threshold dose was used scientifically beginning in 1946. The linear no threshold dose has been taught for many years and is still taught. The linear no threshold hypothesis is that even the smallest amounts of radiation are harmful. 
it extrapolates the information from the lifespan study of the survivors of the atomic bomb tests. According to this theory, cancer risk doubles when dose doubles. It triples when dose triples. And conversely, it halves when the dose halves. Notice there is no evidence of any damage to tissue for a dose of 100 rem, which is one sievert. Only doses above one sievert have documented effect or biological effect. Let's look at or discuss the linear energy transfer function. What this is talking about is the deposition of energy into tissue. Low ionizing levels of radiation transfer energy into tissue. Most of the effects of this transfer of energy are an adaptive uh, response, which actually repairs the cell. Some of the cells die and very few mutate. When they mutate, this happens through either a direct hit or an indirect hit. These mutated cells will result in a benign tumor or cancer, which is a malignant tumor. The possibility below one sievert is very rare, if any at all. To maximize radiation safety, the traditional linear no threshold hypothesis has been taught to radiographers in an attempt to minimize the dose usage when they create an exposure. The usual way we discuss this with radiography students is we go over the theory itself, but then we emphasize that this theory states that no amount of radiation is safe, that one photon of energy can interact with the nucleus of a cell's DNA and cause cancer. The thing we don't stress is, what is the probability of that actually happening? The linear no threshold model is a model used in radiation protection to estimate the long term biological damage caused by ionizing radiation. In this model, radiation is always considered harmful with no safety threshold. Small doses of radiation or low dose radiation appear to stimulate the protective responses of the body, triggering DNA repair mechanisms and elimination of severely damaged cells. As we discussed, we have been exposed to radiation since the beginning of time. We are exposed to cosmic radiation, background radiation, and man-made radiation. Survival of all organisms on Earth depends upon their ability to adapt to environmental stresses, including radiation. Numerous genes have evolved over time to mediate adaptive response to both internal and external genotoxic stresses. This is why we look at the radiation hormesis, low dose radiation model that suggests that low doses of radiation actually activate our natural protection against radiation and repair cells and eliminate damaged cells. Let's take a look at the basis for the hormetic zone for low level linear energy transfer of radiation into tissue. What we see here is that the low dose rate or low levels of radiation when interacting with tissue signal or are a catalyst for a protective intercellular signaling. This intercellular signaling uh, 
causes an adapted protection. The adapted protection eliminates dead cells and repairs damaged cells. Now, when we look at how this occurs, we look at there is a spontaneous amount of energy that is interacting with the genome of the cell causing instability. The DNA gets a damaged that damage results in a neoplasm or a rapidly growing number of cells. The rapidly growing or transformation of cells or neoplastic transformation results in two types of tumor, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. The malignant tumor cells are cancerous. Take a moment and look at the hormetic risk or the J-shaped curve for the hormetic risk model and compare that to the no linear threshold dose curve. This model shows a risk benefit of both harm and a beneficial dose. The beneficial dose is called the hormetic region. After we reach a certain point of exposure, the dose starts to become toxic. And as we increase this exposure, the more toxic the dose becomes. The adaptive response of the body to radiation tells us that we have a number of different defenses or mechanisms to fight against the carcinogenesis that is a result of ionizing interaction of radiation with tissue. It's not surprising because our organisms have been exposed to ionizing radiation since the beginning of time. There is plenty of scientific research demonstrating that the body repairs or eliminates low dose radiation damage. This results in a net benefit. Taking a look at the uh, surviving fracture of the cells that have had a dose of ionizing radiation applied to them, we see that some are non-repairable, some are repaired, and this all depends upon the dose rate. There is a large difference between low dose rate and high dose rate. There is a difference between the cumulative dose rate, where we add the doses up over a period of time, and acute dose rate, which is where we have an all at once exposure. The all at once or acute exposure is more damaging to cells than the total amount of radiation over a period of time. Let's look at cell multiplication or cell proliferation. As cell proliferation decreases, mutation repair increases. What we're talking about is the difference between a rapidly multiplying and dividing cell and a slow dividing cell. Here we see that we have a cell. Within the cell is the cancer gene that is associated with the DNA structure. We have ionizing radiation which activates this gene. With low cells turnover, it takes time for the cells to replicate. This gives time for repair before the DNA duplication. The result is a normal daughter cell. On the other hand, if we have cells that rapidly multiply and divide, they are more sensitive to ionizing radiation. So we take the same scenario, but we talk about rapidly multiplying and dividing cells. So there is high proliferation. There is little time for repair before the DNA duplicates. And therefore, we end up with a mutation. 
The mutation can be a neoplasm that is either benign or malignant. The malignant mutation is cancer. The radiographer formulates the exposure techniques utilized. The technique choices have changed since early days of radiology when we used film screen combinations or the photographic process. This was in 1895. Today we used digital imaging techniques and we create electronic images. Choices for exposure are totally different. In 2022, our technical evolution of both equipment and computer analysis has grown remarkably. The amount of radiation from an imaging test depends on the imaging test being used and what part of the body is being tested. Compared to the early days of medical imaging, we use a minuscule amount of radiation to actually gather more data and information to create our images. Because x-rays involve ionizing radiation, they can deposit energy in human cells and cause tissue damage. It is important to minimize any associated risk to the patient from this ionizing radiation. To do this, we select the best technique for what we are looking for to diagnose. To do this, we choose the exposure factors and we create an energy beam, an X-ray beam of low dose. This low dose energy beam is then collimated or restricted to the area of interest, therefore keeping the exposure to the patient minimal. Let's review some basic energy and X-ray. What we're talking about here is how do we create techniques using ionizing radiation? The ionizing radiation can result in either a characteristic effect or a bremsstrahlung effect. The bremsstrahlung means that the energy slows as it goes farther. The characteristic effect tells us that we have valence shells in an atom and these valence shells are filled with electrons. If we use a photon of X-ray energy, we can displace one of these electrons in the valence shell around the atom. Each valence shell has a characteristic energy. So the atom displaced will require replacement. The energy that is utilized in replacing the displaced electron is characteristic or characteristic energy of that shell. And if you look at the K shell, the average energy of the electrons in this shell is 69.5 keV. Where if we look at an outer shell like the P shell, the average energy of the electrons here is 0 0.008 keV. So now we've created the energies, the ionizing radiation energies that we're going to use for our exposure. To create these exposures, we need to select an amount of radiation, which we select in milliamps. We need to select a KVP, which is the highest photon energy that will be created. And we need to select a time that this radiation is being created. So we have MA time and KVP to create an exposure. Remember, exposures are polyenergetic. The majority of the KEP, KEV, is the average energy of the beam. And it's about two-thirds of what the peak energy or KVP is.
When we do medical imaging, we usually use X-rays, gamma rays, and sometimes we use particles such as alpha particles and beta particles. Normally, for routine X-ray imaging, we use X-ray and gamma ray. X-ray for medical imaging and gamma ray for nuclear medicine studies. What's the difference between the two? Well, X-ray actually gives us a image of the physical tissue where gamma ray gives us the physical tissues metabolism, how well it works. So we have two different kinds of energy that we're recording here. The interaction of high energy photons with matter is the same for both X-rays and gamma rays. So that in other words, X-rays and gamma rays undergo the photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering but it is where the radiation is emitted from that makes a difference. We create X-ray and gamma ray is emitted from a source, a radioactive source. So basically in medical imaging, we use X-ray to visualize anatomy and we use gamma rays to visualize physiology. Nuclear medicine uses radionuclides in medicine for diagnosis, staging of disease, therapy, and monitoring of the response of a disease process. It is also used in the basic services such as biology, drug discovery, and preclinical medicine. Nuclear medicine is described by three elements the clinical problem, the radiopharmaceutical, and the instrumentation. Since the nuclear medicine involves exposure of patients, the general principles of radiation protection should also be applied here. Since we're recording the activity of the radiation as it interacts with tissue, time is totally different in radionuclide studies than they are in ionizing radiation studies. In ionizing radiation studies, we use MA in time or mass for the amount of radiation that we need. And it has a KVP, a peak photon energy that we choose. In nuclear medicine, we use a radioactive source that emits the radiation. The strength of the source is the average energy of the radiation. Time, on the other hand, is how we record the activity. The longer the activity is recorded, the more radiation we can see. X-ray and nuclear medicine gamma rays. The difference between X-rays and gamma rays although they are about the same energy, is their source. Gamma rays are produced from a radioactive source, which decays. X-rays are produced by a mechanical source or by generating ionizing electrons. Since the nuclear medicine technologists cannot be completely separated from source radiation, the source radiation is an occupational risk for them. Scatter radiation should be the only radiation diagnostic imaging professionals are potentially exposed to. However, nuclear medicine technologists also handle radiation sources, and they should utilize the same principles of time, distance, and shielding to protect themselves. Most nuclear medicine procedures are for diagnostic rather than therapeutic purposes. In a diagnostic nuclear medicine study, the biological distribution of the radiopharmaceutical within the patient is used for diagnosis. We're looking at the biodistribution, 
how fast does the radionuclide get uptake into the different types of tissue? Obviously, if the tissue was non-cancerous, it would not proliferate or multiply as fast as cancerous tissues. Therefore, we would get more uptake in rapidly proliferating cells, such as cancer tissue cells. Biodistribution allows us to take a look at the physiology of the tissue. Depending on the type of nuclear medicine scan the patient is receiving, the radio tracer is injected into a vein or swallowed by mouth or inhaled as a gas. It eventually collects in the area of your body being scanned, where it gives off energy in the form of gamma rays. And we look at the biodistribution of the gamma rays. Each radionuclide emits its own energy or gamma energy and has an average energy associated with it or KEV. Technetium 99M has an average energy associated with it of 140 KEV, while fluorine, which is associated with doing positron emission tomography has an average energy of 511 keV. The energy of the photon emitted by the transmission of TC99M is 140 keV and we record that over a period of time. The 511 gamma emission radiation for positron emission tomography is utilized differently, which we will discuss in a moment. Remember, we're using radionuclide sources. These sources are constantly decaying. So we need to know the source strength when we receive it and utilize it. We know that they have a half-life. So for the technetium 99M, the half-life or the time it takes for it to energy to decay in half is about 6.02 hours. Whereas fluorine 18, which we're using in positron emission tomography, has a half-life of 109 minutes and xenon has a half-life of 5.3 days. Now we'll look at another biodistribution technology used in nuclear medicine called positron emission tomography. Here again, we're looking at physiology or the uptake of energy within the tissue. So what are the basics of PET? So how does positron emission tomography work? Well, what we're looking at is recording positron emissions and we're going to record those as we do in a CT scan by a ring of detectors around the patient. We start by having an injection of a positron emitting tracer given to the patient. This tracer emits positrons which travel one to three millimeters prior to colliding with an electron. The positrons collide with the electrons causing what's called an annihilation. In other words, they're both destroyed. And in the destruction, what is left is two forms of 511 keV gamma rays that are going in opposite directions. We're actually working with antimatter here. Gamma rays are detected by the opposing detectors. It is important how they are detected. When a positron is emitted, let's take a look at how the detectors record the energies. We have a true coincidence, coincidence being the two 511 keV energies simultaneously going out at the same time. We have a scatter coincidence, which means that the detectors are picking up scatter, like in scatter radiation, but it is not a true coincidence. And we also have a random coincidence. 
Notice on the true coincidence, the detectors pick up the two energies simultaneously. And that way we can utilize that data to create images. We cannot create images with scatter radiation or scatter coincidences, nor can we create images from random coincidences. Positron emission tomography identifies biochemical activity in addition to structural tissues. An annihilation creates two 511 keV gamma photons that diverge at 180 degrees. These are recorded. The recorded data is used to create anatomy and activity or physiology. Positron emission tomography is a three-dimensional imaging technique designed to measure the level of metabolic activities within a cell. PET is a valuable nuclear medicine tool for studying human biology with gamma radiation. We can study cellular energies, cellular growth, intracellular signaling, and genotype-phenotype correlations. The most commonly used PET radius pharmaceutical is fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG. It's essentially made by incorporating radioactive fluorine-18 with a simple sugar molecule. As you might expect, rapidly growing neoplasms, such as can cancer, utilize glucose as their main source of energy and retain the glucose at a significantly higher rate than normal tissue. The result is a tumor with a significantly greater uptake of FDG. Fluorodeoxyglucose actually emits very low amounts of radiation and has a very short half-life. So radiation protection is very simple with using radionuclides. We can look at the half-life of the radionuclide and use time, distance, and shielding for both patient and occupation exposure uh, control. Because FDG is used to look at physiology and malignant tumors use sugar at a higher rate than benign tumors or normal tissue, we can see even small tumors with positron emission tomography. Let's take a look at how we use anatomy and physiology in PET studies. The first study on the left is a patient using FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, to study a stroke. You'll see in the different composition of images here, transaxial, uh, sagittal, and coronal, that there is an area of non-activity. This means the rest of the brain is taking up the activity or the gamma radiation and there is no uptake in that specific area, which demonstrates a stroke. Conversely, if we take a look to the right, we're doing a study to actually map energy in the brain while we're thinking. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we ask the patient to perform a certain activity, whether it is talking, moving their fingers, blinking their eyes, or some other type of activity. We then can see an area in the brain that is actually stimulated while this task is being performed. And we know that is the area of the brain that is being activated when you do this. So now we can map the brain to see different areas and how they function. Okay, enough about radiobiology and radiation protection. For this portion of the program, we'll continue on with another module next time for a break. <music>